is love is love on the queer family podcast love is love we're simply walking down through the the fred meyer the fred meyer and all of a sudden she comes up behind me grabs my hand and says let's skip out of the store and i'm like i have no idea why she suddenly wants to me? skip yeah oh. because this is weird we don't skip in public <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that and we get out the door and i'm like okay why did we do that? I, you know, whatever. She was like nine at the time. So, and she just said, well, this woman asked me if you were my mom. I said, no. She asked me if you were my aunt. She said, no. I said, you were my dad. And she got this really like gross look on her face. So I just decided we should skip out of the store together. <laughs> and I just started cracking up. And I was like, so you just were basically saying in your face, transphobic lady. And she goes, yeah. I'm petty like that. <laughs> so... Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Queer Family Podcast, the show all about family, but with gay. <laughs> My name is Jamie, and I'm your host, and you are tuning in to the show whose mission is and always has been to uplift, highlight, normalize, and celebrate LGBTQIA families in all their beautiful identities. And today's episode is doing just that yet again. I sat down with Bethany Grace Howe and her 13-year-old daughter, Nola. And we had just a really wonderful, lovely conversation about how Bethany transitioned at the age of 47 on what that was like when she already had a family. Nola was five when she transitioned. And then, you know, getting Nola's perspective on everything, 13-year-old. I mean, if you watch the video... <laughs> you watch the video, you see a lot of yawning coming from Nola, some head on the table action, very 13, because Bethany had made Nola get up extremely early to do this interview. <laughs> so a lot of typical 13-year-old stuff, but also some really amazing and beautiful insight from Nola about just identity in general and her experience of her dad, who... She still calls Bethany dad. That's stuck. It's just a really wonderful conversation. I am. I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Let me know. Um, but before I roll the tape, I want to talk about one thing. I'm not going to do the queer conundrums segment today because I want to talk about something else. Recently in the news, we had some sad news for the queer community. A woman was shot and killed for basically having a pride flag outside of her business. A man took umbrage with that and shot and killed her. Her name was Lori Carlton, and she was a mother of nine. And I am extremely sad, saddened by this. That could have been my mother. That could have been anybody's mother. And she's not even gay. That's the other thing. She's a, just an ally, a beautiful, strong ally who just, you know, wanted to show support, and she got shot for it. So my heart just really goes out for... um Lori's family and anyone living in fear right now. What is happening in this world? And then the man, the police, I think, ended up shooting the guy that shot her. So two lives were lost over this. What a world, right? What a freaking world. What the hell? And it got me thinking about something that I wasn't actually, I, didn't, I wasn't going to bring up. I wasn't going to talk about it because I thought it might be a little too heavy, but I'm going to do it anyway today because as you all know, my daughter recently went to sleep away camp at a camp that is awesome called Camp Highlight. It's a camp for um, children of LGBTQIA plus parents and also children who identify as LGBTQIA plus. So it's a really wonderful, inclusive, queer inclusive camp that just kind of really builds community and gives these children a feeling of belonging. Um, in a world where they don't always feel like they belong everywhere, right? Beautiful. My daughter had a great time. She came home. She can't wait to go back. It was amazing. Um, but as we're driving up there, and actually Anne even asked me, my wife asked me, if you're going to talk about it on the show, don't talk about it until Rose comes home, you know, just to make sure everybody's safe. Because as we're driving up there, you know, this camp is in rural Pennsylvania. So it's like, two, it's two and a half hours outside of the city. And as we're driving, we're getting into more and more country settings in a more rural town. And I immediately, of course, start looking around for Trump signs, looking around at the lawns to see like any political signs, see, you know, how they lean. Are they really red? Looking at the churches, how many churches are in this town? How many, you know, just like 
all the things looking to see, basically to see if we're safe. Are we safe here? Is this safe? And you know, when you go into a small town like that, you're pretty certain you're probably not the most safe. There might, it's probably not the most inclusive place for our families. And then my mind got to thinking, oh my God, what's the security like for Camp Highlight? Do they have security? Do they have guards? Like, and as soon as I thought that, I thought, holy shit, why am I thinking about this? Why am I thinking about a possible gunman? Literally, that's what's in my head coming to this queer camp and, and shooting. Like, I know this is heavy guys. I'm so sorry, but my brain went there. I went there and I got scared because this is like, if there is some crazy wackadoo out there who wants to target queer identities, this is a great place to go. I'm thinking, who knows about this camp? Do the people in this town even know that this camp is happening this week? Because it's they use a, a YMCA campsite. They just like rent the site out for the week. Do they know that camp, what camp highlight is? You know, like all these thoughts are going through my brain. And that is not, excuse my French, fucking okay. That's not okay that I'm so worried about safety. And that even I thought about that for this camp and my child. And that's why Anne was like, don't bring this up until everybody's home safe. Like, <laughs> okay. And then I wasn't going to bring it up. But anyway, it just got me thinking about like, what the, what is happening in this world? Why is there so much hatred for people who are just living their true authentic selves? This rhetoric is literally killing people. The rhetoric that the far right is spewing and it's heartbreaking. Anyway, whoo, well, you got a really nice uplifting episode for you. <laughs> Sorry to bring it down, but these are things we have to think about. Anyway, representation matters. Visibility matters. We need to keep telling these stories and we need to normalize them to let everybody know that, you know, difference is good. Difference is beautiful. And also we're all just like everybody else. <laughs> We're all more alike, my friends, than we are unalike, to quote the great Maya Angelou. And it's very true. Anyway, okay, I got to roll the tape, do all the things, rate, review, subscribe, do the stuff, and um, follow me on social media, watch the video episode, and um, I will catch you next week. I hope you enjoy this episode. Helen and Beulah, my lovely assistants who don't exist, roll that tape, ladies. Thank you so much. <laughs> Queer Family Podcast, love is love. Hi, Bethany and Nola. Hello. Hello. It is so wonderful to have you here on the Queer Family Podcast. It's it is, great to be here. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Listen all the time. Kind of uh, awesome to be here. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Well, so you two are up super early. You were up at 5 a.m., to get here because you're on the West Coast. We are. And you had to travel to a school to do this to get the better uh, Wi Fi, yeah. right? Yeah, Wi Fi out here is, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not like we live in the Stone Age, but when it's like, okay, I need the Wi Fi to work perfectly for an hour, it's like, uh, okay, let's, let's go find a place where they actually uh, are willing to pay for really high quality internet. <laughs> it's a good thing that the school will pay for good quality it internet, it's actually. Nice. That's it's like, a plus. It's like heartwarming. <laughs> Well, I've already taken so much of your lives away from you because you had to get up so early. So let's just dive right in. Let's get into your 30-second elevator pitch. You're going to tell us who you are and why you're here talking to the Queer Fam Squad. And I can't wait to, for this whole conversation. So that's just a teaser. I am Dr. Bethany Grace Howe, and I use that title only once a day to justify my student loans. And I, uh, I work in communication. Uh, advising, um, consulting, doing a lot of things. This is my daughter, Nola Longuera. And I transitioned at the age of 47. She was five years old at the time. And so we've been navigating the world together for the last eight years. And I jokingly call her my mini me. I'm not sure that's technically true. I, I can see the look on her face at that. Uh, <laughs> what I would say is, is that uh, he is my biggest advocate and always has been. And so we're a team, we're a pair and you know, it, it's fun. 
Boom. Amazing. I didn't even put the timer up. Usually I put a timer up and make, to make you all nervous, but I didn't do that. Also, you only went slightly over, there which is go. great. Most people go a lot over. So beautiful, beautifully done. Well, we do stand up. So we're used to having people flash a light in our faces when we're done. And then if you ignore that, they will actually come and muscle you off the stage. So you both do stand up though. That's amazing. Listen, I've been on many stages and done a lot of things, but I don't think I will ever ever have the balls to do stand up. Never in a million years. Nope. You could just do it in the technical sense. Just go up there, be on a chair and stand up and walk off the stage. Then <laughs> technically a, and yeah. I could say I yeah. did it. Um, That's it. I, I like that. You get to live upon. I've done it for a long time, but it was, I don't know. She went to see one of my sets. It's a place on the weekends. They do stand up and it's all family friendly mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And I think she was like six years old. She went with me and just said, I want to do that. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's always been her jokes, what she thinks is funny, what she appreciates about life. I did a lot of the writing, but mm-hmm. gotten to where, you know, she she writes her own stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, if it's I have a five year old, so I can imagine the kinds of um, jokes you were helping to write. <laughs> Kids are fascinating to me. I mean, I've been a teacher most of my life. And, uh, and a camp counselor and kids see things in really funny ways just because, mm-hmm. you know, they're not cynical yet. They're kind of operational in the sense that everything kind of has a literal meaning. And when you listen to what they say about that, you know, it's kids say the darndest things or whatever. It translates nicely to stand up because it's sort of these, you know, but um bum observations. That's awesome. Yeah. And my thought was uh, I taught middle school for 15 years. And one of the hardest things that I would see is, is girls coming into my classroom in seventh grade, bubbly, excited, full of life, ready to take on the world. And by the time they got to eighth, ninth grade, everything had sucked the life out of them. Not all girls, of course, but a lot of them. And I just was, mm-hmm. I need to raise my daughter in a way that she's not immune to that, but can take it on. Very simply, if you can get up on stage in front of hundreds of people and do stand up, you can do anything. Uh, it's the scariest thing I've ever done. And she yeah. does it and she's not really scared of anything. Why do you do stand up? Why am I talking? I'm a Because I'm funny. Well, Nola, how old are you? 13. And you're doing stand Good for you. God, that's amazing. We need to get into the story, first of yeah. all. But <laughs> Nola, what do you call Bethany, your parent? My dad. Dad, because Bethany started as dad for you. Mm-hmm. I was five. And I was like, no, I just got this down. You are not changing it on me. Don't even try. <laughs> no. We tried. It did not. It did not stick. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Nola, you are your dad's biggest ally, sounds like. That's freaking awesome so. if, I, if you don't mind my saying so. Yeah. Yeah. When I say you're my biggest ally, what does that, what does that mean to you? I know what it means to me. I could talk forever about it, but. I don't know. <laughs> I guess it means that. I don't let you go to Florida. <laughs> said, Good. Said, there you go. Said the girl who's, we're going to Florida next week. We were at Fred Meyer's, a, a grocery store chain out here. It's part of Alba Kroger Way. This woman said something like, uh, you and your mom sure are pretty or whatever. And Nola said, oh, that's not my mom. And this woman said, oh, is it your aunt? She goes, no, it's my dad. And when you told her that, what was her reaction? I think she was kind of shook as her little core we're simply walking down through the the fred meyer the fred meyer and all of a sudden she comes up behind me grabs my hand and says let's skip out of the store and i'm like i have no idea why she suddenly wants to skip yeah because this is weird we don't skip in public (laughs) wrong with that and we get out the door and i'm like okay why did we do that i you know whatever she was like nine at the time so and she just said well, this woman asked me if you were my mom. I said, no. She asked me if you were my aunt. She said, no. I said, you were my dad. And she got this really like gross look on her face. So I just decided we should skip out of the store together. <laughs> and I just started cracking up. And I was like, so you just were basically saying in your face, transphobic lady. And she goes, yeah. I'm petty like that. <laughs> so that's um, amazing. And how old was, how old was Nola? How old I, were you, Like Nola? eight or nine. Perfect. I love that. I mean, like at school, you've had some issues sometimes with some of your yeah. 
some of your peers and not exactly being open-minded about things. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's made you a bit of a target from time to time. Yeah. Has it? Not, not anything like some of the over the top stuff. Well, you know, did yeah. threaten to kill me, but that's kind of why I switched classes. Second grade threats, but still, I mean, just, uh, like a, a kid threatened yeah. to kill. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think I took it that I don't really know, but he wouldn't, it's not like I doubted that he was going to do that. So he still has fun from time to time. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so we've well, made I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> when you work with second graders long enough, they say a lot of these, you know, I'm going to kill you or whatever. But, yeah. you know, this yeah. kid was just he still a, does it. a little meaner, a little more. He made her a target because he made her a target because that's what he does. But my <laughs> identity was something he loved to exploit. He'd see me well, walking he down. He didn't the, bully me until I told him you were trans. Yeah. So I we'd hmm. be walking down the hall or whatever, and sometimes he'd pass me in the hallway, and he could just look at me. One time he whispered to the kid next to him about me, and you know, just uh, Ugh. yeah. From kids, like it's like a different yeah. kind of feeling when it's from kids. They are. I mean, I don't it's like my species overall. <laughs> it's a. I mean, this is a really supportive community. Her. Her friends have known me as her Bethany since they were in kindergarten, mm-hmm. which is, you know, they're still at that stage where gender is just, you know, okay, whatever. So most of her friends just, oh, there's, there's, there's Nola's dad. Here she comes. And it's not a, it's not a non sequitur. They will ask me questions. Not like, not necessarily like, well, cause I was, um, I had came out as bi in sixth grade mm-hmm. and then I was like, no, that's not right. And then I was like, hey, I'm straight in a Texas roadhouse. So that was fun. <laughs> As you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so so my friends, like some of my friends, they would ask me questions because they didn't quite understand. But one of them, she said, do you have to get like permission to have sex with the opposite gender to have kids? And I was like, no. Um, this is so- where you lie to them. Yes, the stork has an online form. <laughs> um, and so I, and I started, I was, I was like, well, you know, there's like the sperm donor stuff like that. And I was kind of struggling. And then my other friend, she goes, no, well, stop. And I was like, what? She said, I understand. I've watched Modern Family. And I was like, okay. Oh, oh my God. It, <laughs> I, she wasn't even the one who asked the question, but she could tell that I was struggling. And I was just like, how do I explain this? Wait, she was asking, do you have to get permission to have sex with a person of the same sex? No, with, of the opposite gender, so you can have kids. Like, if <laughs> like if you were a lesbian and in a relationship with another woman, would you have to get permission from your partner to sleep with a guy to have a kid? Oh, oh, now it, yeah, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I will say this: these kids clearly do not listen to this podcast because I know right. the answers to all of these things. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. Like, you know, representation matters. Visibility matters. Yeah. That's why we need the books that are being banned. I explained it to her, but then, like, my other friend, she, she was like, no, it's okay. I understand. I've watched Modern Family, and I was like, I, okay. I do, do you, though? Because it, they adopt I, it. Yeah. yeah. I do think it points out, as you just said, the importance of, of representation. And she's talked to me over the years about because she has this highly visible transgender dad I mean, I drive a bright red convertible sports car. So again, there is absolutely nothing subtle about me. Nothing. Got a girl. Got um, a girl. And, you know, and, and this is, I guess, stereotyping in a way, but it's like, okay, Nola has a trans dad. I'll bet she knows about these things. After the election of 2016, she and I talked about the fact that my life was about to become more complicated. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, and you might, because this has continued as you've gotten older. She had friends in her classroom whose parents are from Mexico Mm. who were willing to talk to her about their fears of being sent back Mm. because they kind of just got that Nola and her dad were on their side, whatever that meant. And they felt safe talking to her. And, you Uh know, I mean, that wasn't the intention or anything. I, I knew my identity would play a role in her life. I did not ever see it spinning out quite like that, especially at the age of six. Right. Totally. But it's also like seeing your allies, right? Seeing the other marginalized folks around you or the folks who are possibly dealing with discrimination of one form or another, we we see each other, you know? It's like that nod in the street, I see you, you know? And it's kind of yeah. 
when when S H I T hits the fan, um, I'm trying. I'm 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 using nice language because you're thirteen. Oh, her grandmother's from Texas. It's fine. Yes. <laughs> well, when it hits the fan, we we <laughs> we try to find the allies. We try to find the helpers, the ones who understand, right? So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I and I'm I'm very proud of her that you know that's a role that she's been happy to step into. She does not shy away from it. She doesn't. You've got friends that are LGBT oh, whose mean, parents yeah, don't even, close. yeah. And you've got friends whose parents don't even know mm. and they'll talk to you, but they can't even talk to their own parents. Mm. Well, I mean, I have one of my friends who he's trans now. And so he hasn't told his parents that yet, mm. but I believe he was gender fluid at one point because it would be like some days, like I'm a girl, some days I'm a guy. Like I was like, okay like um <laughs> and like with with my theater friends i become my theater friends token straight <laughs> so <laughs> you need one you really yeah do. Um, i'm so ashamed I'm kidding, I, <laughs> I know like sometimes we would like joke around with each other and like, like when i was by and everything we would joke around with each other like if we were mad at someone we would joke and say like well you're straight and so because apparently that was the highest level of insult we could say to someone else and, I'm hearing uh, all this for the first time, by the way. This is amazing. Um, and so one of my friends, they're gender fluid. And so one day I joked and said, well, you're straight. And they're like, well, I'm a guy, well, I'm a guy today. So yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I hate you. So touche. Much. Touche. It's like, touche. You can't win. Well, I love that because you're kind of flipping the script. And, you know, just your life has made you so open and honest with this stuff that you're also just kind of a, uh, it feels like you're just a haven to the kids who might be questioning or are not questioning or sure, you know, so good job. It so points out what, the, you know, I mean, we hear it all the time, the agenda or whatever, mm. the, you know, the, the trans agenda, the gay agenda. The gay agenda mm. today okay. at three o'clock, yeah, we'll I, go and shove our, our agenda down, down the people's throats. And at four, we must go and protest for basic mm -hmm. human rights. I just got a comment last night from some wackadoodle who, on one of my episodes about a, a, a trans guy. This whole long tirade about all you see nowadays is, is these stories in the media and it's turning our children into forcing these identities on our children. This whole time, I can't yeah. even regurgitate what this person said. Uh, what? You know, it, you're, at, you're at the wrong audience, sweetheart. Go somewhere else because this is not the place. I must tell you, having been part of numerous groups over the years, there's no way there could possibly be a gay agenda I can't sit in a meeting that long, and I don't think any of us can. <laughs> but what her school sort of points out to me, and again, I think people would find this surprising about a rural town in, in Oregon, but I think it really is true, is that it is just part of their normal everyday lives. And so they get to look at it, try it on, so to speak, think about it, consider it, and then decide and I wouldn't even say decide is the right thing is they have the freedom to recognize who they are mm -hmm. free of the context of everybody telling them what they can and can't and should and should not be. Mm. And does it surprise me at all that when she was, you know, younger, probably like 10, it was, I'm a lesbian. And then as she got what? a little older, you it was, no, me? you. No. Yes. And no. then, oh yeah, you don't remember that either. I didn't buy you a flag because at that point I still wasn't sure. And then it became bi. <laughs> and and then eventually it was, you know, it's that I'm straight. And, you know, people have asked me, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, I don't um, know. I am unwell. I, no. It, <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, I just. People Maybe are not like, for are that you, reason. I mean, like, are you surprised that happened? And I'm like, no, because she lived in an environment half the time with me where she was constantly surrounded by LGBTQ people and messages of equality and pride festivals and just hanging out at the University of Oregon in the journalism school, which, you know, our, our colors are green and yellow, but we got all the other rainbow ones in there too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just the environment and the people she was exposed to. She looked at all of those people, you know, and again, I was her dad. And so, yeah. you know, kids sometimes kind of lock on to what their parents are interested in. And but eventually, as she came to understand who she was through the context of her own self, it was I'm a straight cis woman, and cool. Yeah, you know. yeah. It was because like sixth grade, I was like, you know, women are kind of hot. Um, 
And then, <laughs> they are agreed. Um, <laughs> and um, so I was, I was always bi, but um, at some point, I kind, I thought that I might be a lesbian because I was like, guys are kind of ew. But I, I never, I was never a lesbian. Well, yeah, you would know the guys are gross. Yeah. Why you changed? Um, <laughs> and um, but so I was never a lesbian, but I did think about it at one point, and then I was like. Like, I was kind of going towards that, and then I was like, wait. And then I was like, wow, men. And then okay. I was like, listen, women are still hot, but I don't feel that way about them anymore. And then I hop back to my default settings. <laughs> <laughs> default settings. Uh, yeah, In default settings, marks, in other words. As the homophobes like to say. Yeah. Oh, my God. Wait, okay. Listen, this is beautiful. First of all, the fact that you've hopped from identity or trying on identity to identity. And it seems to me, Nola, like there there was no shame in your hopping through these different identities. Let me try this out. Let me see how this feels. Oh, this feels right right now. Or was there any shame? No, I wasn't necessarily like I didn't I didn't ever feel any shame about it. I think there's still kind of like I at one point one of my friends he was like you're gay and I was like no I'm not and he's like yeah you are and I was like no he was like you literally told me that you were gay you told <laughs> that's why you were gonna break up with me because you told me that you were gay and I was like no and I just belong gaslighted him into thinking that I was straight the whole time I don't think he believes me but it was kind of fun this yeah. is a complete escalation of it's it's not you it's me. Well, okay, he broke up with me, so it, it's still, but... I think she does this stand-up where she, she comes out as, as straight. What's so interesting about it is is that all of her stand-up is always about her life and her perception of the world. And she's always dived right in. She'll be like, I want to do this, I want to do this. I mean, we have, we have made fun of musicals, middle school dances. It's a family stand-up, and so she... She was kind of going, and then she finally just stops, and she goes, I'm sorry, this is a family outing, never mind. But coming out as, as straight, so to speak, as we kind of joke about it, I said to her, I said, because we were talking about she's like, okay, what should I do? Now? And I told her, and I said, I think you should do this. And she said, I don't want to do that. It was not something that she immediately saw the humor in, I guess, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so we really talked about that one. It was, and I said, I said, look, I said, I think... I'm not ever going to tell you what you have to do, I said, but if you are thinking this is not something you can joke about, I said, I think the opposite is true. I said, the, the most profoundly funny things I have ever said come from a place of just intense discomfort. And it's about sort of turning it on its ear is sort of taking control of it. And again, I think you can go too far with that. I don't know if you're familiar with Hannah Gatsby, but she's, uh, she's spoken a lot about how her comedy became a place for her to hide her pain. And, mm -hmm. and I don't, uh, I've learned from that, but mm -hmm. it's still a way of me kind of taking agency over things. And so we kind of had that talk. I think this would be really good. And she didn't agree right away, but I think, and I don't know how long it was, but eventually she just was like, okay, I'll do this. And once she did, I wouldn't say it wrote itself because stand up rarely does. But it came pretty close. I had kind of wondered for a while if she was straight. And I mean, I'm, I, I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but I, I really had because just, you know, you listen to your kids and she'd eventually kind of gone from talking about girls she kind of liked to they were all boys. And when and I would occasionally say to her, you know, do you think, think you're still by? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just I like a boy right now. But eventually you stopped hearing about the girls. And so. I mean, I, I joke, we were out at the Texas Roadhouse and they asked if we were willing to wait 45 minutes for a table. And I've regretted that decision ever since because clearly 45 minutes, anything associated with Texas can really mess you up. But <laughs> the whole thing with Texas Roadhouse is because this girl had asked me out. Well, actually, well, the first thing she said was, what's your sexuality? And I was like, OK, um, I said, I'm bi, but I prefer guys, which I hadn't told my dad. Um, but I said that. And then I was telling my dad the story. My dad was like, wait, what? And I was like, yeah. Because I didn't actually tell her any of this. I told her best friend and then her best friend told her. Like, then you're like, wait, what? I was like, yeah. And you're like, this is news. And I was like, yeah. And then I told her that I don't like girls. And well, actually, then I told her no. And then I realized I was straight. So 
That's well, my straight awakening. Well, and how okay. long had that happened before we had the conversation at the at the roadhouse? And the thing is, is that we we went to the roadhouse and we met <laughs> our best friends there. And it was the four of us at dinner. And the, the topic kind of came up. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I, I just got the sense that she wanted to say something. But what I realize now was that, I mean, this is my interpretation. She felt safe telling me there because my best friend was sitting across the table and so was her best friend. She knew I would take it better because my friend was there. And I don't know if that's what was in your head or not. Whatever it was, she did. And it really kind of, I wouldn't say bothered me. Well, no, it did. That she didn't feel safe telling me that. And I mean, it that really she, That she was straight. Of, yeah. That, yeah. And it really did flip all of, all of this on its ear, is that she had hmm. spent so long being my advocate, flying the, literally flying the, the bisexual flag and everything else, that her, her to tell me that she wasn't made her nervous, made her uncomfortable. Hmm. I think it was mostly because you had gotten me like all this like buy stuff for Christmas. And then I had kind of realized that I was straight when you had gotten it for me. But then I wasn't going to tell you that because I was like, mm, and, and, and well, and, and to that point, awkward. we were in the car after dinner, just the two of us. And I did say to her, I said, Nola, I feel terrible that you didn't feel like you could tell me that. And she said, well, I just, I didn't know how you'd take it. Or I thought you'd give me a really hard time. And I said, I'm no, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a hard time. I said, I am going to need the flag back and uh, you're going to need to forget the secret handshake. And she <laughs> said, that's secret handshake. And I said, oh, that's right. I didn't teach you because I knew. And at that point she hit me and she said, this is what I meant. And she was serious. And I was like, okay, so don't do that again. But right. it, it really, you know, it surprised me how much it sort of threw me and not like, not like I was angry or whatever, just, you know, as enlightened as I am, how much that had sort of embedded itself in the way I saw our relationship and how much I was unwilling to let it change. I mean, I, I obviously was and am, and, but it just, I was like, okay, I get this. I mean, I, I don't understand parents being intolerant of their children and everything else, but it, it was an interesting sort of flip around because I was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I don't care if my kid came out. And, and honestly, I would say that one of the things that's been oddly hard about it is that I recognize that in identifying as cis and straight, her life just got a lot easier. And I mm. feel guilty about the fact that that's true. I mean, I, the fact that I felt relief, it was like, well, thank God, at least she doesn't have to deal with all of this. Thank God she can have a family and it's not a legal, financial, bureaucratic nightmare. I mean, it was just sort of like this sense of relief. And again, I feel oddly conflicted about that. And still, it's kind of a, a process for me. I'm yeah. thrilled with who she is, but my reaction to it has been not what I thought it would be. Layered. Very yeah. layered. Yeah. You said something that I hadn't thought about when you told me that, you know, she came out to you as straight. I see the humor in it. And and now you're opening my eyes up to the different layers, but also to the your feeling of sadness that she felt afraid to tell you or that she had to tell you in public. And also yeah. you, that layer to it. And yeah, there's so many layers to this. So since we're there, can we take it kind of to your journey, Bethany, to becoming who you are today, like finding your true self. Yeah. 47 years old, never had an inkling, never had a thought. Saw Caitlyn Jenner on the cover of Vanity Fair and mm -hmm. my eyebrows went up. At the time, I was living in this little small town where I still am. And I was the town mascot. I dressed as everything because I used to be a mascot for a university, for a professional baseball team. And so I was also the town drag queen because I dressed up as things. And so people asked me, they said they saw Caitlyn Jenner and they're like, so you're going to do that? And I'm like, no. And it was sort of that moment where people ask you when you're due and, you know, you're not. And then everyone just kind of slinks back and is like, okay, I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I asked that in public. But <sighs> it clearly opened some kind of a door. And that was just as I was leaving teaching to go back to get my PhD. It was just one of these things that I kept trying to learn more about to kind of prove mm. to myself I wasn't. 
And every door I kicked open suggested to me I was. Hmm. What was maddening was that so much of the information that I wanted, God, you get on the internet and at the time, and I think this has changed, but you'd Google FAQ transgender and five of the first seven listings were things never to ask a transgender person. So it's like, okay, cool. No one to ask. I, I would try to kind of read like kind of like peer reviewed research because that's where my brain was going. It was all behind firewalls. Mm. And, and so I finally reached this point where I felt I knew that I, I was transgender, but I could not find a single thing that, that would say I was. Because my biggest problem was, was that, you know, Caitlin, Laverne, um, Janet, all of them have these narratives that they have known this since they were cognizant of identity. And I, I had not. I can look back now and see a lot of things along the way. I mean, let's put it this way. We used to go out in the field and play Charlie's Angels, and I always had to be Bosley. Bosley <laughs> sucks. And, and the time, at the time, it was, well, Bosley does not have a sports car. Bosley does not have a car phone. Bosley is not going to do anything cool but sit in an office on a leather couch. That's dull. But what I realized now was that Bosley was boring because Bosley was a dude. But those things didn't all connect. And it mm. wasn't until I got to school and started being able to talk to professors and other people who understood this. And they didn't say, oh, yeah, you're trans. They gave me things to read. They, they gave me things that they said, I think you might find some of the answers you're looking for in here. And I just remember reading uh, Jenny Beeman's The Lives of Transgender People. And they're on, I can't remember the exact page right now, but there it was. Two thirds of transgender people know that they've been this way since they can remember th conceptualizing it. But up, but up to 33% report something else <laughs> that they may have led a perfectly normal, straight, cis, well, not straight, but cisgender life. And then something triggers it. And all of a sudden things start coming together in a very quick fashion. <laughs> Caitlyn Jenner on the cover of Vanity Fair triggered it. And so I went from hypothesizing it to realizing it to announcing it to living it in four months. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. And this was about eight years ago? Yeah, this was 2015. I began living publicly as Bethany on January 1st. And I told everybody, no, no, I'm going to wait for at least a year. And everybody that knew me well apparently was had a betting pool how long I would make it before I actually did this. And uh, yeah, I made it to New Year's. And somebody wow. just said, I win. But you had a five-year-old at this point. Yeah. You were living, were, were you living a straight life? I mean, were you yeah. in yeah, my, a relationship? I mean, my wife and I, our marriage was over for a variety of other reasons, but I was still identified as straight, male, married. And all of a sudden it was, hello world. Barton has left the building. Bethany is here. And it was pretty binary. It was quick because that was the only way I knew to yeah. do it. I know you did it super quick and you did it your style, but what was that like? It was great. I mean, the, the thing is, once I knew, I knew. And once I knew, trying to hide it, suppress it was giving me panic attacks I have rheumatoid arthritis and I keep it in control. And all of a sudden I was having flare ups all the time. And I'm like, what is going on? And I realized it wasn't my RA. It was, I was having panic attacks that once I knew that this is who I was, I couldn't hide it. I couldn't suppress it. I couldn't, it was awful. And it gives me a stunning, um, I, I do not know how people who figure this out but have to stay cloistered and hidden. I don't know how they do it. Mm. And it does explain to me the suicide rate. It explains to me to the depression because I'm the most privileged transgender woman you're ever going to meet. I came out in a, I mean, Eugene is liberal. The University of Oregon is even more liberal and the journalism mm -hmm. school is even more liberal. And I came out in an environment where I was supported unconditionally. I literally had some of the smartest people in the world at my disposal to help me solve my internal problems. If I hadn't had that, I don't know that I'd be here. And it does not surprise me that so many of us are not because it was mm -hmm. awful. I mean, it was just awful. It, and it wasn't, you know, somebody, and you've probably heard this, you're so brave. 
And I'm like, no, no, Brave is running into the burning building. I ran out of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> this isn't bravery. That's, this a, is survival. that's a great way to put it. Yeah. So yeah, it was lightning quick. The flip side of that was, was that it was so easy for me, so free of a lot of the societal pressures that people feel that I found it real easy to ignore the fact that this was still hard. There were still things I was figuring out. One of the things about being a writer and writing in public is that the really stupid, arrogant things you write are out there forever. I was a writer mm. for the Huffington Post at the time. And I read some of the stuff I wrote about how easy this was and how great this was. And gee whiz, I don't know why everyone's so angry all the time. It just makes me cringe. And who knows, if it wasn't out there in public, maybe I'd hide from it. I doubt I would, but yeah. Oh no, my arrogance is out there for all the world to see. <laughs> Everybody has their journey, right? Everybody has their journey and your truth is your truth. It is, but I, I will say this, and this is something I've kind of taken to heart. My truth may be my truth, but I think what I was doing was wondering why everybody else was so, what was wrong with everybody else that their truth could be so completely misinformed, coming to realize that everyone's truth is their truth, and it is not a function of anything except who they are. And I, I, work, I work for the state of Oregon now, and I had the honor of basically getting to write our gender implementation and equity guide for the workplace, they let me loose. And one of the things that's embedded in there in every chapter, in every section is everyone's journey is their own. There is no right or wrong way to look at anyone and say, that's not the way this should be done. Nobody gets to do that. It's a very different kind of HR guide. <laughs> yeah. But, great. You know, yeah. It's so insightful. I think I like I'm loving everything you're saying. And I've actually learned a couple things just talking to you, Bethany. The 33%. It's something statistic. like statistic. Yeah. It's interesting. My mom has uh, friends that I grew up with. So they're like aunt friends, right? Yeah. So their kid who I grew up with recently, and I'm 45 and he is probably 46, recently came out as trans. And the parents are really having a hard time swallowing it because there was no sign of it ever, ever, ever. And I'm thinking in my head, no, there is, there was no sign of it. And I totally just misgendered her, her. See, because this is all very new to me. Yeah. And so that fact just kind of opened my eyes. And I know well, my mom listens. So my mom's probably like, oh my God. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting you say that because when I told my parents, they, same thing. They were, what? There was no sign of this. And I've talked to other friends of mine that have done this maybe a little later. And one of the things you hear from a lot of them, the ones that have supportive families, the ones that are trying to be the ally, trying to be the parent that they know they want to be, is all of them are, not all of them, but it's like, God, no idea. Just wait, what? And what's so fascinating about that to, to the, the people that I talk to that are in the same kind of group is God to us, it is so obvious looking back all of these things that now we look back and we're like, oh my God, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it explains sometimes though why people are, I just worry that you haven't thought about this long enough or that you're making a hasty decision. And what I think they're missing is, is that in our minds, it's, it's the recognition of what this is, is new at the risk of sounding like the nerd that I am, the data supporting it is not new. And, and what I liken it to is, you know, when Copernicus and Galileo were like, you know, the sun is not the center of the universe. The earth is not the center of the universe. Everything goes around the sun and stuff goes around other things going around the sun. And it was heresy. It was crazy. All you had to do was look at the data going back hundreds of years of where people saw Mars in the sky, Venus in the sky. And, and it wasn't that Mars suddenly switched directions or was now in a different orbital body, the orbital place. It was, we now understood the data that went back hundreds of years about where these things were because we mm -hmm. finally knew the right question to ask. And that's, mm. that's how I explain this to people. No, the data has been there all the time. I just did not understand what question I needed to ask. And once I understood the question, am I transgender? The answers had been there for 40 years. This is not sudden. 
this is who I've always been. But I understand why they don't see it because that sort of internal epiphany, boy, man, that's kind of years and years alone. Mm. And hopefully you have the people around you that believe you, even if they don't understand you or the quote unquote data that brought you there. Transition really quickly. Yeah. I know that Nola was five. Nola was like, it was, was that a quick, easy switch? For the most part, uh, research kind of suggests that up to about the age of five, gender is still a construct within the way they perceive it. It's still a construct that really doesn't have any meaning to them. At first, she just was, she didn't like it because it, it meant change, but it was also embedded in her mom and I's divorce. And so, you know, this was conflated with other things. But once we kind of stopped, we, we tried Maddie for a while. And I think once we both agreed, we hate that. And I'm not saying other <laughs> people that have found uh, meaning in that shouldn't, but it just was not us. And once I stopped trying to force Maddie on her and me, it kind of went away. I think my moment of epiphany was, I was about a year into my transition and she said, I wish you had never transitioned. And I said, why? And she said, because when you were a guy, we used to do stuff. We used to go places and now we never go anywhere. And I said, honey, that's because I'm a PhD student and I don't have a job and I don't have any money. <laughs> and I said, that's not being trans. And she said, oh, you mean we can <laughs> go to Disneyland again? And I said, yes, honey, when I'm done, we can go to Disneyland again. Oh, okay. No, this is great. I'm really glad you transitioned. You seem happier. <laughs> <laughs> And then ironically, okay. about two weeks later, a conference called and offered to fly Nola and I to Disney World so that I could speak. And at that point, yeah, she was sold. Daddy being trans, wow. this is awesome. This is the way <laughs> This is the way to go. And how about with your wife and the divorce? Was that, how did that go? And if this is too much information to ask? No, no, it was awful. We had all the baggage that comes with a normal divorce, two people pretending that they were completely amicable and not. But one of the things that was really hard for her and she got really mad at me and I didn't have a lot of empathy for it at the time, but I do now. Is she just looked at me and she said, I'm not a lesbian and I don't want people to think I am. And the way I took it was, oh, so there's now something wrong with lesbians. Okay, you claim to be. What I realized was when I was out doing my PhD research, I, I actually traveled all the United States and I interviewed 66 transgender people for like an hour each. Mm -hmm. And one of the narratives that I heard over and over again was how difficult it was for the spouse. These were some people would stay together, some people hadn't, but their sexual orientation, the way people saw them had changed because of what their partner had elected to do. And mm. I never thought about the fact that somebody's identity is defined completely by somebody else when you're in a monogamous relationship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that my ex was opposed to lesbians or whatever. It's just she was not one. That was not her identity. And, and again, I don't think I understood that until I started talking to, oddly enough, lesbian couples where one of them had transitioned. And so now they were outwardly a straight couple. And that mm -hmm. sense of identity that they had felt out in the community as, you know, two empowered lesbians with a family, it had been erased. And it was really hard for them. And it broke up a lot of their relationships. And I think that's when I understood what she was telling me. Still pretty angry for a while. She went through a health scare that made me realize that, you know, as passive aggressive as we were being with each other, that if it had gone another direction, the last thing that I would have ever said to the mother of my daughter would have been something kind of pissy. And I was like, that is not something I'd want to live with. That is not something I need my daughter to live with. And I just was like, I said to her uh, when she recovered, I'm done. All the BS, I'm done. I know it'll take you a while to believe me, but I'm done and I'm sorry. And it's taken us a few years, but no, we're, we're pretty good friends now. We, we joke, we laugh, we, you know, tell each other things that you tell somebody who maybe used to be your best friend. So mm -hmm. it's good. And it's, it's nice. She has a hard time with pronouns still with me, understandably. So she just calls me Bethany all the time, which is fine. <laughs> That's amazing that it that it got it has gotten to a good place. So congrats. It was helpful to me to go out and talk to so many people who could articulate to me what she was feeling 
Mm-hmm. And because whether it was the passage of time or the preservation of the relationship, they could explain it in a way that wasn't embedded with a lot of emotional baggage. It allowed me to sort of look at it from her standpoint, free of our relationship and say, okay, I get this now. And once you can truly understand it from somebody else's point of view, it makes a difference. At least it should. <laughs> That's why these stories matter so much. Yeah. That's why your story matters right now, right here, right now, because you're probably helping countless folks out there right now. I'm not, you know. That'd be nice. Well, you know, you telling your story loud and proud like this, kudos to you. Good job. Thanks. It's awesome. And I think you're fantastic. I think you're amazing. Well, thank you. It's, uh, yeah. I enjoy my life. I'm very lucky. I've got a lot of very supportive friends who are kind enough to tell me when my makeup looks awful and don't ever wear that blouse again in public. It's it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You need those friends. We all need those friends. Oh, I do. Yeah, we all need those. Thank you so much for sharing your story and you thank bet. Nola for me for coming in and being a brave 13-year-old and telling Nola's story because at 13, I was not nearly as well adjusted as Nola is. Well, it was funny this morning. She was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. And I'm like, you always know what to say. And I was kind of looking at her during this. And I was like, okay, you got to warm up. And she finally did. She is not a morning person. Though. She loves what she does. She's very passionate about the things she does. And, um, you know, you can't ask much more than that. So, Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bethany. Where can everybody find you? Yes, thank you. I have a web page that I'm still overhauling, but you can find me at Bethany grace.how.com. And I'm still figuring out what I want to do with that. And my email is bethany.grace.how at gmail.com. I like connecting with people and people email me and call me and the door is always open. And uh, I, I do stand up, I host things and I always tell people jokingly, but it's kind of serious. I will go anywhere for free if it's below the Mason Dixon line between November and February because the coast of Oregon is rainy and miserable and it's cold. And all you got to do is buy me a plane ticket and put me in a Motel 6. I'm good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's get Bethany booked. And are you on social media at all? I am. I'm on Facebook. Bethany Grace Howe. And it's the only one I can truly seem to navigate. I know I need to learn Insta. Everyone is just like, oh, can I find you on Insta? And I'm like, you can. But Facebook is uh, usually where to find me. Okay, well, everybody, you know, reach out, find find Bethany, go watch some stand up with Bethany and Nola. And if you're ever in Eugene, Oregon, or the coast of Oregon, reach out, say hi. I will, definitely will. I've actually never been to Oregon. And it's one of the places I want to go. I'm from the West Coast, so it's something else, and uh, not shockingly, it's very different than they portray on Fox News. I, I know people are going to find that <laughs> remarkable, but uh, it's true. Yeah, shocking. Well, thank you so much. You bet. Queer Family Podcast. <sighs> well, folks, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. If you did like it, go ahead and listen to another one. We have, or watch another one. We have so many for you to choose from. So just go click on one and do it. And also don't forget that I do have merchandise. So if you love this show and you want to represent queer families in all our goodness, go to T public slash the queer family podcast and look at all the designs I have there and put them on any of the products that are in the store. They're all beautiful. And I'd love you to wear some of our merchandise. So just go ahead and do that. And thanks so much for tuning in yet again. And um, please keep tuning in. I'll see you next time. Thanks again. <laughs>